All right, well, we got a few more people joining. All right. Well, again, my name is Portia Kippel Smith. I am excited about our conversation today. Uh, and I know that over the last few months, fairness as well as inclusion, you know, have been at the top of minds for, for all of us, uh, not just around the tech industry, but quite honestly, all over the world. And people are once again, taking a look at this and seeing the ways most companies hire software engineers and other high paying skilled roles in tech is just completely broken. Many hiring systems are set up to really filter people out from different backgrounds rather than welcome them in. And that's why we have an issue with hiring and retaining, in my opinion, underrepresented minorities in tech. Uh, the good news is that at Carrot, uh, we help organizations improve the way they hire software engineers specifically by making interviews more predictive, fair, and enjoyable. Three years ago, I came up with this idea about real talk because I felt like in a room where we had underrepresented minorities, we could have a great conversation about how to make recruiting and hiring engineering more inclusive. But today, it's really taken on a new significance. Earlier this year, uh, we shared our commitment to the Black community. What we did is we launched a $1 million practice interview program. And this initiative kicked off with, from organizations like Intern Hacks, as well as Howard University. And what we want to do is level the playing field by giving more Black software engineers access to the same types of resources and technical interview experiences that alumni from what I consider to be the traditional top computer science programs have access to. Uh, we, I think we all use events like Real Talk to make sure that we're listening to our community and understanding what having a fair and inclusive company feels like, while also learning what happens when businesses don't do that. They're not fair, they're not inclusive, they don't have the right cultures, and the impact that that has on Black employees. Our moderator and co-host this afternoon is Wahab Awalabi. Wahab is the founder of URX and a diversity business partner at Facebook. He sees the challenges we're talking about every day, as well as our panelists. Wahab, thank you so much for taking the to help lead us in what today is our very first virtual edition of Real Talk Diversity in Tech. And thank you everyone for attending. Wahab, take it away. Hey, uh, Portia, thanks for that <clears throat> warm welcome. I'm really excited to be a part of this. This is, um, I've attended uh, these in the past. I've been a panelist and so I'm excited to be a moderator. Um, Without further ado, I would love for our uh, panelists to have an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, we're really blessed to have them join us today. And so if we can start uh, with Roz, uh, please let us know uh, where you're joining us from and tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. So my name is Roz Francis Harris. Uh, I'm actually joining from Seattle, Washington. I am the uh, Global Head of Direct-to-Consumer Technology uh, Talent Acquisition for Warner Media. Uh, we're a global company, global media company. You might know some of our brands like Warner Brothers or HBO Max, CNN Digital, uh, or Cartoon Network if you're like me and you still uh, enjoy those. Uh, I've been in talent acquisition for 15 years and, and I've been very blessed to where all of those years have been within the technology space. So thrilled to be a part of this conversation. Uh, thank you, Wahab and Portia for this, 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 comp, this forum to, to talk about these very important matters. Uh, Raphael. Hey everyone. Um, good afternoon. Good morning. Wherever you're calling from. Um, Raphael Williams, um, technical recruiting program manager here at Twitter. Um, like Ross, my entire eight year um, career in um, talent acquisition has been in tech. Um, st um, stemming from university recruitment um, to a little bit of industry and now I'm um, a program manager where I ensure that I curate strategic experiences to attract underrepresented talent um, and how to get them here um, at Twitter. Thanks. And Shara? 
Um, so my name is Shola. Um, I'm a software engineer, senior software engineer working at IBM. Um, I'm actually going to be starting as an OpenAI scholar in about a week. So I'm excited for that. Research in AI, um, and then I also do software engineering. Um, so that's me. I'm right now in Maryland, so just outside of DC. This is on your reality. <laughs> we've got we've got dogs barking in the background. <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna kick it off with the first question, uh, Shola. I'd love if you could just tell us a little bit about your experience. You have a new opportunity coming, but can you tell us about your background and your career to date, and how you've managed that process as a software engineer and applying to multiple roles and deciding where you're taking your career? Uh, sure. Um, sorry, I think I'm just gonna repeat the question a little bit. So. Um, I believe the first question was just around starting my career, getting involved in tech, um, and just a little bit of background. I'm from the Maryland area. I ended up going to Stanford. I studied computer science. Um, and my first role in the industry was at Intuit. Um, so a lot of love from Intuit. I think I saw someone on the call who works at Intuit. Um, and, you know, it was really quite a hard process to honestly land my first role. Um, both from the perspective of finding internships or even finding a full-time role. I would essentially, I think at that time I applied to over 100 positions and I would always get to the end round and would essentially be rejected because of a culture fit. And at the time I very much felt like, you know, you're a great person, you know, you know, we know you can do the job, but because you're black, we're not sure if you would fit in with us, so we're not going to hire you. Um, and it was difficult because there's this element of, is it because I'm black? Is it because I'm a woman? Because of the other aspect of how heavy sexism is and the tech industry in particular, is it because I'm both at the same time? And so I think it, at least for me, was very difficult because it's also contrasted with, um, at least for similar graduates coming out of Stanford, um, the it was a lot easier for my classmates to get into positions that I just didn't have a, I didn't have the opportunity to get in just because of some of the nuances around race and gender and such. Um, and I think at least for me, it just highlights, I think just how difficult it can be. I think there is sometimes this narrative around people not being qualified enough and I just haven't personally seen it in tech. Usually it's the honestly that you need to be better um, than your classmates in order to get the same thing. And I think that is very tough to deal with. I think people don't tell you the process of not just proving yourself technically, but proving yourself in other spaces. So I know I've said a lot, so I'll stop here. No, no, I think that, I think that you, you make a lot of good points and people can learn from, from, from your experience. You know, when we talk, or, or is there something else going on and you can never really put your finger on it. Um, Roz, you know, you've been, you're, you're, you're a legend in the town acquisition space. Yes, yes, you are. Um, how do we start to eliminate some of these biases? Because that's what's creeping into the process, especially with the great opportunities that startups and early stage tech companies can provide um, for, for their early software engineering employees. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and Shola, thank you so much for like sharing that very vulnerable story. I both wanted to, to hug you and then go fight somebody as a result of hearing that, you know, and it's unfortunate, but her experience is the same experience of a lot of individuals that look like us uh, in this space. Um, and I think we, we know how we got here. I don't think the, the question of how we got here is even relevant anymore but more so what can we do about this to make sure that other people that look like you and I aren't feeling this way. And I think uh, one of the things that, that TA professionals can do, because we truly do, we right at our fingertips, we have the access to all of these things. And it's taking a step back to look at how we are actually evaluating talent for this particular example, right? Of us me putting her on the phone with a hiring manager to evaluate if she's a cultural fit before we even know if she can code or not. Why? Right? And if you look at a lot of processes, that happens first. Um, or worse, someone that sits in the roles that we sit within in talent acquisition imply their own biases to this process and she never makes it past the recruiter. Right? So I think one of the things we need to first address is what are we actually looking for? 
right? Cut the bullshit, and I'm gonna use that word, right? Just cut the crap. This is the technical skills we're looking for. My conversation with Shola as a recruiter needs to be about her technical skills. What is she looking for? And then we can talk about career trajectory. What has that experience been like for you? And then when I move that forward and say, Mr. or Mrs. Hiring Manager, I want to submit Shola to the next steps, there should be a conversation. It's great. Let's send her the assessment. And that needs to speak for itself. And so I think when we talk about uh, these types of biases, look at your process. How many people am I talking to before you even know if I can do the job or not? And then do you actually even know what the job is you want me to do? Because that's another thing uh, that it, it sounds so simple, right? We make these, these fluff job descriptions so that we have room sometimes to eliminate people, right? What's the actual job? And let's screen you to that. I think my, 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 my philosophy on a lot of things when it comes to uh, inequality is to stop hiring dickheads. And I say that, but if you cut poor middle management out and we can actually talk about evaluating uh, skill sets rather than people will move a lot further faster on a lot of these issues. As a talent acquisition professional, I'm very unapologetic about how I partner with my managers during the manager intake meeting. Um, it's all about like, I'm not here to deal with your shit. This is what you're going to do. You're going to stick to the candidate profile. Um, and if I look at the data and at any point I see there's a drop off with your team because of the biases and your inability to screen in, to um, tap into the talent and have more of a generalized profile, then we're yanking the wreck and you don't need to hire. And so in the university recruiting space, however, um, I think companies over pivot in the top universities like UMich or Stanford or NYU um, and don't go to the schools that are more opportunistic um, to lean into the talent that they need to. And I think that is a really big miss um, for a lot of companies. And I think us as talent acquisition professionals we have to lean into that um, to go to some of the previews or the spellments, um, which might require a little bit more work in the interview process. But at the end of the day, you are diversifying your workforce. Um, and that's how we as talent acquisitions can kind of lean in a little bit more. And it's tiring because we get tired. We get tired of having to go out and advocate or even have to fight our internal stakeholders to even get individuals through the interview process. Um, but I think we just have to continue that fight because I always say we, we come as one, but we stand as 10,000. And it's a fight that we have to keep um, doing to get other people into the space. Hey, well, yeah. Hall, I, actually, I want to add one thing to what Raphael said, because he said it so quick, which was drop off. And I don't know if everyone knows what he means by that. But I think as people of color in talent acquisition, when someone comes to you and says like, hey, Roz, I want to talk to you about diversity and pipeline. I want to make sure that you've got a diverse pipeline. I actually chuckle because I don't know one black person who doesn't believe in a hookup. And what I mean by that is whenever we are somewhere, we're, t we're trying to constantly bring in others. So what I wanna challenge TA partners to start to do is really track your slate versus the hiring decision. Because what that will then show, and it is beautiful when you actually can do it because that drop off rate that he's talking about, I'm giving you a day of our slate you're choosing to hire 69% white men and 20% white women and 4% black people, right? So let's talk about the decision-making mechanism that are going into place because of your finalists, this is what they look like, right? And so I think when we, when we, when we start to get asked these questions because the political climate is, is forcing companies to help have some accountability into these metrics, understand there are parts of these that we actually don't control. And the parts that I do, I'm going to show you that not only am I giving you a diverse slate, you're choosing not to hire these folks. Now let's talk about that part of the process. I think some of the probably the worst experiences were, were probably connected to people who made assumptions about my capability. Um, I'll give a really short example. I applied for a company that I'm sure everyone here knows. And um, I had the interview my first and second round with the recruiter, which was great. Um, and with the engineering manager, which was great. But when I had my first video interview, it was two people interviewing me. Um, and the one guy essentially spent the whole video sort of talking down on me. I answered everything correct, everything went well. Um, by the end of the interview, he essentially said, um, oh, this must be too easy if you're able to get it correct. Um, he then goes on to essentially ask about a program called Code 2040, which is a um, program for Black and Latino engineers, and then goes on to talk about um, 
how he would never want someone from Code 2040 and how he'd never want anyone who's black or Latino working at his company. Um, and this was just an employee of a team that I would be joining. He wasn't even necessarily going to be my manager. And so I think, I guess I'm framing that because of, I think it's different in every industry, but I think sometimes because of the lack of, I think social etiquette engineers can have, there are ways in which you can very, just legitimately be faced with someone who is essentially like, you know, I don't want, I not only do I not want to support your career, but I intentionally might want to derail it just because of my own sort of ignorant thoughts on who I think you are. It's, it's a very real experience, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I, I would run to the hills, right? Like, I mean, I, I can't imagine anybody who, who would go through that experience and walk away thinking, I, you know, they'd want to work um, at a company like that. And I, and I think to expand on that point, I actually think that's what recruiters miss, is that sometimes I think there's this idea of like, you know, diversify the pipeline, the pipeline, the pipeline. And I would actually argue not only is the talent there, but there isn't enough vetting out um, of the non-minority talent. I think there is this idea that like minorities need to be fixed instead of this idea that like, you want all your employees to have certain values and if any of your employees exhibit certain values, it jeopardizes the whole team. So I look back at that company and I actually think back to my conversation with the hiring manager, with the HR, all of them were fantastic. The engineering manager was great. Um, even my conversation with him, um, he gave me praise. He was very great. He was even formulate potentially how he would want my career to look like. But that was derailed by one person on the team who very ignorantly said, you know, I don't want to work with anyone who looks like you. And I think the problem is not just him, but the fact that the people around him didn't condone it. Because what it said was that that's okay to be here and that his presence was more important than mine. And I think people don't necessarily realize, particularly those who are in higher positions where they can hire, how the ways in which they don't vet the values of everyone walking through the door jeopardizes everyone, but particularly minorities and as far as the experience. Because not only would I not want to join a company like that, I wouldn't recommend it for friends of mine, particularly in engineering. Um, and then even if I were to join, I wouldn't stay long. And so it sort of perpetuates this problem. But that's the negative side. Um, I look at a company like Intuit and I've had the completely opposite experience. So. It, it unfortunately can be a very hit or miss. Yeah, I mean, what, what I think what we're starting to talk about, and I, and I saw a question from from the the chat, is is accountability as well, um, at, at all levels of, of this conversation. And so, Raphael, you actually started to touch on this, which I thought was a great point around holding high managers accountable with that intake meeting. Um, can you uh, speak a little bit? Um, more about how you've held interviewers accountable, high managers, and how that might translate to more success in creating an, an, an equitable um, interview process. And I'm going to come to you, Roz, next in terms of how can we hold our executives accountable or at least bring them in um, to this process. Raphael? So I think it's a mixture of both. So first, we need to get that candidate feedback so we can go back and definitely have that raw authentic conversations with our hiring partners on the experience of um what someone had so this new generation for sure in the university space are definitely willing to come back and let you know how their experience were in the interview process and you're able to go to those hiring managers or those teams to be unapologetic about being like hey you you jacked up and this is why you jacked up and so we're not giving those offers um but also making sure they have those unconscious bias trainings Granted, I think unconscious bias training is bull crap because you know what your biases are. So you go into those interviews um, with that level of, um, I'm not gonna hire this person, but it's also what, as a recruiting partner, what are you pouring into that team? How are you educating that team um, on uh, DEI efforts and moving things forward? Um, and vetting them out is just, as I said earlier, is, is that data yeah. and holding them to the fire um, and consistently with that feedback that you're getting back. And I always ask candidates, if they drop off as a diverse candidate, why did you drop off? What happened during the interview process? What was wrong? And so I can go back and have that um, 360 loop with the team. It's awesome. One, one thing that, and it's funny, I've been doing a lot of discovery this week and it just 
it absolutely taps into what Shola just described. What I'm finding is that at the executive level, I'm not having an issue with accountability in terms of them saying that this is a commitment, they're making it, putting funds behind it, putting resources behind it. Where I'm finding that we have opportunity uh, as an industry is how well we trickle that commitment down through the rest of the organization to the interviewers who are gonna be on the loop. Uh, you know, in lots of engineering interviews, sometimes they'll have a cross-functional partner from product or from design come over to that loop. And has it been communicated to that person that this is a priority for our org? And then what I'm finding too, is that when we have these problematic viewpoints, such as I don't really think there's value in hiring someone from code 2040, for example, who's condemning that person and saying, that's not okay, that's a problem. And until you've gone through some training and development, we're gonna take you off interview loops. Um, because what's end up happening is you're creating this like subculture. You have these values that you posted on your website you have these values that we're supposedly screening people to, but you have no peripheral to the subculture that has been created. And to Shola's point, it's largely in engineering uh, organizations. And I, I mean, I don't like to say it's because engineers are have different etiquette. Um, it's true. It's true. <laughs> you, can say it. it, it's, it's true. you can say it because you're an engineer, so I'll let you say that. Ross, we got to hire some engineers over there. <laughs> But what I will say is the priorities are different. Like I spend every day talking to people. So I, I, I have a, a heightened to like, you know, social acceptable things to say or like body language or, or what pronouns to use. Engineers spend most of their time coding and they're very matter of fact. And so when it's time for me to look up and say something to you, I'm gonna tell you what's on my mind so I can get back to coding, right? Um, and that's the piece that we've got to become more in tune with when we are HR partners and, H and diversity partners, even TA partners. We need to know who we're putting on these loops to evaluate talent, whether it's diverse talent or white talent, because we're letting bullshit slide that shouldn't. So I think the accountability, while I do love holding the execs accountable, I'm all about it. Bonus them, take the pay, do all the good things when it comes to executives. But I think there's a more that we could be doing throughout middle management and the interview panels to ensure this sort of, um, Fairness and consistency is actually happening in the interview process. Ross, yeah. I want to I want to add on to that. Um, I think that we use that the engineering subculture as a BS way to excuse uh, the whites when they're there. Are you actively dialing in? Or are you just doing it doing this as a I got to be here or I must have this interview? So I challenge engineers if there are any on the call, um, pick your head up and have a level of empathy for others and listen. Um, to others and stop trying to feel like you need to have the engineering uh, excuse of this is the way things are because we're engineers. I, I want to add on to that. I also want to add on to the fact that in engineering hiring and a lot of engineering decisions are made unanimously. So all you need is one person to dissent and you get rejected. And that's particularly true at almost all the big companies like Google, Facebook, etc. And so that really poses a challenge because if you have one person who um, may have stereotypes or bias, you can score perfectly on the interview and you won't get the position. Um, and I think one short story I have around this was actually working at Intuit. I was part of an I was part of a hiring crew where we were hiring for interns and there was a young Latina woman who was in the interview lines and um, one of the guys who was just very ambivalent on her, um, he was like, you know, I mean, I think she has a lot of potential, but you know, I don't know. And he was leaning no but he hadn't actually said anything that would sort of say that we shouldn't hire her. Um, he just didn't seem super excited about her. Um, and I think, at least for me, maybe because of sort of the empathy around me, just being able to recognize like, you know, because she may not look like his image of what like a younger engineer would look like, he just is not thinking beyond like, I guess she's all right. Um, that I, when I just asked more and I said, okay, well, what's wrong? What happened in the interview? He was like, actually nothing. I mean, she just interviewed great. You know, it seems like she has a lot of potential. And I was like, well, you know, this is an intern role. We hire interns with potential. So, you know, what you're all saying marks what we would be looking for. Is there anything that would say otherwise? And really he couldn't. And I think even me just asking that question and ended up flipping him from a neutral sort of ambivalent position to actually you're right, this is a student position. Why would I expect 
other anything other than potential like these are students and i think me even just saying that without necessarily i didn't attack him i didn't say like oh you're being biased i just posing a question almost made him think like i you know i don't even know why i didn't connect that and as soon as i said that he advocated for her she got the position and she's been at into it for several years now and i think about that in terms of we think that sometimes it's big things that we have to do to change and sometimes it can even be small things. And I think going back to, I'm sorry, I forgot who said it earlier, but just at least with interviewing, it needs to be around the technical. And when I really pointed out the technical, that's when we realized that actually everything is solid. There is no reason actually, um, you know, there is no sort of negative here, so we're gonna do it. And she's been highly successful since then. And so I, I think about that as just an example of how easy it is to change and something like that, it sounds small, but that internship, I think she's been at the company for several years now. And so I, I just think about that, that there's just so many people on the cusp of like having that opportunity in their career that I feel like just being a little bit more mindful, we can make tremendous difference. Well, well you're, you're spot on, right? I mean, so that, that first internship leads to the next one, which is the reason why somebody might get the opportunity for the amazing full-time full-time job. So, so you, you, you're spot on. Um, before we shift gears a little bit, uh, we have a question um, from, from the chat that I'd like to uh, throw to the group and, and get your thoughts on this. So um, this is from the, an anonymous attendee. As a leader, I'm absolutely appalled at the comments of the team members surrounding not wanting to work with someone who was Black or a Black female in particular. My gut instinct is that I would fire that person but I wonder if you all think that's the right solution. I mean, I'm biased. I would absolutely say it's the right solution. Um, but what, what, I, what I do want to add to the, the, the question is, as the leader, the question then is posed, what did you do to allow this to happen in your org? Right? How did you get an individual on your team who felt this way? Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean by like, and I think, Shola, you nailed it when you say, we screen uh, minorities so heavily on culture to make sure that they fit the culture that we just kind of omit that for non people of color. And so uh, it's holding that same standard to everyone across the board and not making this assumption that people of color need to be fixed in order to fit into this. So when you, when you, it is appalling and that person should have, should have absolutely been fired. But the more important question that I would ask is how did they get here? How did they get through the process? to be able to work here and we not know this is something they think about or how are the, and, and to, to show his point, there was someone else in that room. There was someone else in that room who said nothing. Yeah, and I, I, I love what you said. I think everything you're saying is spot on. I think it really goes to ironically the culture of the environment. And I think what's better than even the firing, because the firing is just sort of the one instance, but I think for me what I see in tech is that there are lacks of professionalism um, in the engineering cultures that I think is very different from maybe sort of established like finance companies and other industries. And I think it's in part because in crafting culture, um, especially with a lot of the big tech companies, anti-racism wasn't included in that culture. And I think that's the sort of bigger issue that companies don't own as far as when they really think about their culture, there's this element of like, you know, diversity is sort of seen as a separate issue as opposed to this idea of if we really have a company and a culture that is, you know, against racism, against sexism, and is really truly open, um, when the pipeline comes, we'll be able to foster that growth within our company. And I, and I think what companies are actually realizing is that that, that growth, not only is that growth not fostered, but when people do diverse talent does come, they leave, in part because these things just, they don't exist. Um, but I will say that despite, I think, what can sound like negative, because we're, we're talking real today, um, there are also, I would say, unexpected places that I feel like have been home to, have been places where I think people have been really able to, to support diverse talent. Um, I mentioned Intuit, for me personally, was a place like that. I know Slack has been a place like that for a lot of my friends, companies that have really made a commitment to diversity and it shows throughout the, 
throughout the platform. I think MailChimp is another example of an engineering company that fosters that growth. So these companies are there and they're strong, uh, but I think it's also communicating out there so people don't feel like they having a career in engineering means that they won't have access to coworkers who respect them and things like that. It's there. Yeah, some of the points that uh, Shala is making, and I want to go to Raphael with this, how have you seen companies successfully invest time and money um, into programs, into cultivating uh, relationships, communities, maybe tools and products um, that have led to some success and increase in representation? Um, so I know of a few companies that have done really cool things about like looking at, I know a lot of um, non-traditional backgrounds. So going to coding schools, going to boot camps um, that are centered around um, non-diverse talent, not just going to pluck the talent, but also um, giving um, scholarships or resources to help individuals be able to pay their way through um, those boot camps. Um, Google, for example, is doing a really cool job where also they are doing um, scholarships for different IT backgrounds. So the IT certificate or the uh, product management or data analysis. Um, and so they, I think they're walking the walk and talking the talk because some of those individuals don't have to have a bachelor's degree to go into those level of scholarships. Um, and so I think that is one of the really cool ways that they need to um, dial in and kind of doing that and putting that money where it, where it actually is um, and moving from that performative. Um, that's what I've actually seen. I know Twitter. Uh, I know we see Jack a lot throwing money out a lot at the community, at o ODSD, et cetera, et cetera. But internally, we're doing a lot of internal work to ensure that we have the resources and to bring diverse talent in and to keep it and retain it and educate it um, and give them a place to have a voice. Now we're doing a mentorship program internally where black, brown, women, et cetera, can move up to be leaders instead of being the ICs because we don't see them as leaders. And so I think that's what I've seen so far throughout my career. And that actually make an impact to the community have been really good to see. Yeah. I, I want to say, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to stretch this too much, but would it be fair to say that, you know, as like just being a part of the black community, I think we're very, um, like, you know, we support each other. It's like, a, it takes a village, that mindset of, hey, it takes a village. And I, and I think it, it means something um, to folks when they see your company doing these things that are actually making an impact. And frankly, it helps your brand and inspires people to want to work for you, right? Want to work for a company. Is that fair to say? Is that, I mean, I don't know what's, is, is this something that we've experienced can or I, am I off base? Can I tag on to um, what was just said? Um, I wanted to just say, I wanted to also just clarify, I think, where we are. I think that people don't realize that, I think it's been true for a lot of oppressed groups. So this is women to some extent, uh, Black people, Latinx. From a certain extent, um, the way institutions were traditionally structured, it has excluded people of color and people from really even being a part of the conversation. And so when I think about media, for example, being excluding, excluded from advertising dollars meant that black media and media that sort of served these different subgroups couldn't grow past a certain level due to that exclusion. Similarly in tech, that sort of exclusion has limited sometimes the career and the progression of certain people. Technology has radically changed that. We see it in music, with ways in which 